Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5, Heredity. This is video number 29, and we're going to be looking at population genetics over this and the next two videos, uh, each with a slightly different focus. And for this one, we're going to focus on conservation. So what we need to do is investigate the use of data analysis from large scale collaborative projects to identify trends, patterns and relationships. For example, the use of population genetic uh, data in conservation management. So one of the important things that we need to be looking at here is large-scale collaborative projects. So obviously what's going to be most important is for you to actually have a look at some of the uh, data or these data sets during class time together when we can work through them together. Uh, so this will just be a bit of an overview at this point. Uh, we want you to recall the definitions from, of population genetics that we've looked at before. And so obviously what we want to start doing now is link some important concepts around population genetics to things like conservation data and ideally to see how we can relate uh, what we know about from population genetics to specific named species. So firstly, why is this important? Well, it's important because the theory of evolution via natural selection is based on variability. So it's based on this whole idea that there is variation within populations, that the populations themselves have a range of different alleles, a range of different genes, and then a range of different phenotypes, the way, ways in which those genes are expressed. And it's that whole gene pool, all of the potential alleles that are available within a population that continues to act or, or to be acted upon by the selective forces of the environment, uh, of biotic factors such as food, predation, um, finding a mate, and so on. Now, when we start to look at um, population genetics, not just from the um, plant and animal perspective, but also from the human perspective, we find a number of different um, sources of variation. We've talked about variation very generally in the past, things like sexual reproduction, which is bringing combinations from different individuals together, uh, things like um, crossing over, which can again switch some of the genetic material around. Uh, we now know that there are, are more things at play that create variation. In fact, we'll even have a look at things like mutation in our next uh, module as uh, more sources of variation, and there are a lot. Uh, a couple here that are worth quickly uh, listing for you is allelic variation, which I guess is the most obvious one, uh, that we do have a number of alleles for particular genes, and so within a population, the sum of all of those is what is potentially available within the population. We looked at um, Hardy Weinberg and why sometimes uh, our assumptions about recessive genes disappearing or recessive alleles disappearing from a population may or may not actually occur. And we've also looked at variations like multiple alleles and also traits that maybe depend on more than one gene. We've discussed uh, SNPs previously, and also we've started to look at copy number variations. So this is base, basically what we talked about um, in terms of uh, those deletions, uh, insertions, um, substitutions. Uh, there's more variations that can occur in the um, genetic sequencing than we've talked about previously um, and expanding on some of what we've talked about gives you hopefully a little bit of an idea about the sources of these variations. We've also talked about tan repeats, uh, these VNTRs, uh, which are slightly different to the previous but uh, not dissimilar in the sense that we're looking now not at uh, mistakes or changes in the code but repetitions in the code uh, which can uh, occur on a small um, repetitive basis or quite large repetitive basis and also things like epigenetic markers. So there's a range of different types of things that can create or um, enhance uh, the variability within a population. How does this act on natural selection? Well, it acts on sele natural selection in one of three main ways, and we call these uh, diversifying or disruptive selection, stabilizing selection, or directional selection. So uh, in each case, if you, if you consider the red line as the population, the original population, and then the blue lines as being um, the population after uh, it's been acted upon for some period of time. Then you can see in the first case, 
what we have is what's called a diversified or disrupted selection. So where we had a population which maybe was sitting um, all similar looking, um, what we've done is we've kind of moved away um, from the average phenotype and we've gone to the extreme. So you can see we've gone from a central um, peak where most of the organisms had the, kind of the average uh, and now we've gone to uh, a bimodal distribution where we've got two quite distinct different um, types of phenotypes being uh, expressed here. In the second type, which is the stabilizing one, you can see in the stabilizing one, what we're, what we're doing here is uh, the reverse pretty much of what we had of the first type, which is now that around that um, that average, that sort of midpoint, if you like, um, we're stabilizing that population so that that remains that um, peak, but actually we get less and less of the extremes. So you can see that the um, frequency of the extremes is decreasing, uh, and we are, in this case, favoring that kind of uh, average phenotype. In directional selection, and it's probably not unusual to see that uh, giraffes have been uh, chosen as the, the um, type species for this particular one. You can see what we've said is we've gone from uh, one type, a short neck giraffes, uh, over time to favoring long neck giraffes in the sense that whatever it was in the environment, um, which is likely to have been food source, for example, that uh, drove the um, selection process in favor of longer necks, that that has shifted the population over time. So much smaller frequency, of uh, the shorter neck giraffes and a much uh, larger frequency of the longer neck giraffes. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about population genetics. We're talking about changes, um, change in allele frequency. And change in the allele frequency will often affect the genotypic ratios. And because of the link between genotype and phenotype um, in terms of the genes being expressed, then also we may get a change in the phenotypic ratios as well. So these sorts of frequencies or frequency changes that can occur in a number of different ways for a number of different reasons can see the populations shifting in one of these three main ways. And when we examine them, what we notice is shifts in the frequency of the alleles in one of these three ways. What's this got to do with conservation? Well, it's probably got a couple of things to do with conservation. Um, the first thing is what we've just talked about, the fact that we can start to examine, now that we have better tools for DNA sequencing and profiling, we can start to look at um, populations, not just from their phenotypes, not just from the physical expression of those genes, but now into the genes themselves, the alleles, the DNA sequences, and see what's actually happening and see what our actual frequencies are and whether or not there's any change that's occurring. As time goes on, as we do multiple studies over multiple generations, are we seeing any change in these allelic frequencies uh, or in the, uh, a change in the genotypes and phenotypes? Obviously, we've talked about things um, like the peppered moss And the fact that this is uh, quite a nice uh, example that's being used often as a study of a natural selection in real time. Well, to get a really a deep understanding of what's actually happening in the population, we'd want to have a look at those moths uh, at the actual allelic frequencies. Is there between so the, the light and the dark colour and the fact that we we sort of say, well, the, the lichen is a light colour, so it favours the lighter colours um, unless there's a lot of industrial activity, which deposits um, black or, or carbon deposits that make the um, lichens darker and therefore are better camouflage for against predation, which is the birds eating them. And studies have been done um, to try and determine whether or not these uh, were actually the case. But we can now also look at those frequencies, those frequencies of alleles and see whether or not they are shifting over time. Now this is very important when we're looking at rare and endangered species because obviously that's the group that we're most interested in trying to preserve. And what we want to try and avoid are things like bottlenecks 
As you can imagine, as the numbers in a population start to decrease, so the variation uh, or the variability in particular uh, will drop. And in fact, some of those alleles may start to disappear from the population if the, if the name, numbers become uh, critically endangered. Um, if you think about the fact that uh, a cheetah population, for example, reduced to two individuals, one male and one female, or th that then recovered, or could trace their ancestry back to those two individuals. Uh, that's the sort of thing that we want to try and avoid uh, in terms of bottlenecks, because it means that the whole of the gene um, pool um, is reduced back to what's in those two individuals. So where we can try and uh, make sure that we avoid numbers getting too critically low that that uh, happens, uh, we do. And obviously zoos uh, here like Taronga, uh, Western Plains in Dubbo, do a lot of breeding programs that are fantastic in terms of what they're trying to do to counter some of these um, problems that we have, not only with rare endangered Australian species, but other species around the world. The other area that's probably important for conservation is food and agricultural species. And they, they are starting to dominate the earth. There's still um, predictions about significant increase in human populations, uh, probably at least through till the middle of um, this century. And as a result of that, the, the demand for food, for land to grow that food, for the type of food that we grow, um, those sort of staple crops like wheat or rice or corn, uh, which are grown in, in uh, massive tracts of land around the world, uh, are going to continue to, to need, uh, be needed on a large scale basis, particularly if our populations, uh, our global populations, continue to grow. So what this means is we need to have a look at some inheritance patterns. We need to try and manage endangered species and avoid the bottlenecks. We need to think about future planning. What are we doing with our land? How are we uh, allocating it? Uh, and we also need to look at things like microevolution, uh, evolution that's occurring at that uh, within species level is there shifts that are happening in those uh, frequencies of genotypes and phenotypes that we can see happening like they did in the in the peppered moth and can we track those back to the environmental factors that are influencing them. We'll look at a case study in class because we do need to look at some uh, big data in order to get an understanding of exactly what's going on. So hopefully this has been just a good little intro uh, and thanks for watching.